On September 4th, 2024, LSS dropped a bombshell of a band and restricted list. Art of War, Bonds of Ancestry, Cashin, Oriana Mystic Tenant, Tome of Aetherwind, Tome of Divinity, Tome of Fiendal, and Tome of Firebrand were all banned from both Classic Constructed and Blitz starting September 9th. This is by far and away the biggest ban list this game has ever seen and has absolutely been dubbed the Great Book Burning of Flesh and Blood. On top of this, in the same article, James White himself went into detail about about the game's core design principles, updating them to reflect what their current goals are. This video is not going to be a full breakdown and reading of the Band of Restricted article, since so many other people have done it already, and you could also just read it for yourself. Instead, I want to talk about the implications that this announcement has for Flesh and Blood as a game. So let's hop in and take a look at why I think Flesh and Blood's future is a bright one. The first and most impactful part of this announcement was, of course, the ban list to end all ban lists. Seriously, like this thing was like looking at a Yu-Gi-Oh ban list and I, I honestly love it. There's something so interesting and exciting when a big shakeup like this happens, you know, providing that you're not playing any of the decks that were majorly affected. <laughs> the biggest ban here, of course, is Art of War, which has been a powerful staple since Arcane Rising. Chain, Fi, and Zen are just a few examples of decks where Art of War was an insanely powerful card with both the draw effect and the anthem. What likely kept this card in the game for so long was the fact that it was a decently expensive staple majestic from you know the second set in the game meaning that it was no small card to hit however because art of war has proven to be broken time and time again it's finally been relegated to the living legend format bonds of agony was also hit which is cool because as an enigma player honestly fuck zen but the other six bands are all just draw cards cashing in the tomes do vary in power and usability some give current heroes too much free power like tome of divinity or on the other side will one day do it as the card pool expands like Tome of Firebrand. Banning all of these cards in both CC and Blitz will significantly lower the ceiling of quite a few decks, making it much harder for those heroes to have insanely over the top power turns. And this is a change I both really like and think is necessary. Flesh and Blood, especially Classic Constructed, used to be this super tight back and forth where every decision you made was important and so many games would end with both players at one life just trying to get that last little bit of leverage. But for a while now, the game has felt a little more high rolly, like way too high rolly. Seeds Chain, Channel Mount Heroic Briar, Aether Wildfire Kano, Tome Prism, and just Zen. Uh, they're all decks that could do these major power spike turns where it doesn't even matter how far the life totals are, the game just kind of ends there because it's so much advantage either through damage or in Prism's case, just setting up an unbreakable board. So I personally love that they're bringing the ceiling down for a lot of heroes, especially with generics like Art of War and even Tome of Fiendal, which, you know, I really like that card. The fact that LSS is open to banning these cards also opens the door for what might be hit in the future. For example, Command and Conquer is an extremely powerful card, and LSS have printed many other versions, but they're just not quite as good as the OG because it's so strong. And what about Fiendal Spring Tunic? I mean, they keep making class and talent chess pieces, and they're either just like strictly worse than Tunic, like the Redback Shroud, or they're pushed as hell like 12 Petal Kasaya. Heck, James White has even talked about Sink Below and Fate Foreseen being so good that they restricted the design of new D-Reacts, so there's even a world where maybe we see those staples leave CC and Blitz. Like, can you imagine Classic Constructed without Sink Below? I'm not saying that it's gonna happen, but at this point, it kind of feels like anything might be possible. Now, I'm not personally on board with removing the 0 for 4 D-Reacts, but I could see a day where Tunic and Command and Conquer are removed from both CC and Blitz. But here's the thing, I think the only way they could even be considered to be banned is if the Living Legend format becomes popular enough. Flesh and Blood sells itself as a non-rotating game with only the heroes and their weapons leaving, and banning cards essentially means that they're just useless. Thankfully, we have the growing Living Legend format, Flesh and Blood's true non-rotating format. Not only can you play your hero forever, it also uses a restricted list where cards are put to one copy instead of being banned completely. Simply put, this is the format that could keep cards that were banned in CC alive, not only giving players a place to play them, but also also to help retain the value. It really sucks when you buy a card for your deck just to have it banned a month later. So unless Living Legend is popular enough, I don't see LSS hitting something like CNC or Tunic in any other format. Thing is though, I could see LL being a very popular format. I can't speak for everybody, but I honestly really like Eternal formats and Classic Constructed is kind of like a semi-rotating format. So being able to play a truly non-rotating format is right up my alley. And I also wouldn't mind CC without a lot of these more powerful staples. Everybody runs Command and Conquer and so many decks run Tunic that forcing players to play the C and C light cards or reworking their decks without Tunic would be an interesting shakeup to the format and it would help maintain its power balance. 
Legends. They could let Living Legend be the place for games with the most busted cards and strategies and have Classic Constructed be a far more balanced, moderate power level format for competitive play. Now let's say LSS do add more of these staple cards to the ban list alongside Tome of Fiendal and Art of War. If they do, and the Living Legend format becomes popular, that could mean one day we could see a non-CC focused reprint set to manage prices in the future. I don't think this will be like anytime soon, but let's say LL keeps growing. Since Art of War isn't in Classic Constructed, you know, the main format, it probably isn't going to get reprinted in a main set. Right now, Art of War might have tanked in price, but eventually supply will dry up and there will be enough LL players who need it. Without reprints, it will slow to get more and more expensive. So if LSS does add more staples to the CC ban list, this could lead us to getting a reprint product not unlike the modern master sets that Magic used to have. These sets weren't legal in the standard format, but they got to inject new cards into the eternal formats and make targeted reprints. And honestly, those master sets were awesome, so I would love to see something like that in Flesh and Blood. Of course, everything I'm talking about right now is something that would likely come in the distant future. Flesh and Blood has been around for five years, which feels like a long time, but it really isn't. I mean, things like Tunic and Scenes being banned in CC, the growing popularity of LL, and that, uh, you know, LL reprint product probably won't come for at least another five years, if that. I just, I can't help but feel extremely excited by such big changes and what they could mean for the future. Classic Constructed has had a pretty rough few years, starting with Monarch, really. We've had a few good metagames, but we've also had a lot that were dominated by one over-the-top deck. Chain, Briar, Starvo, Lexi, Zen, you know, all of these were heroes that just sort of made Flesh and Blood less fun than it could have been when they were at their best. But with LSS openly bringing down the ceiling of the game, I really do hope we're returning to a more moderate classic constructed format, where games go a little longer, not old him long, but just a little longer than first cycle, and I hope that the giant power turns are something actually earned and not just, oh, I drew Art of War and I win. And again, for those who like Flesh and Blood at its peak of power, you can play Living Legend, which is starting to get its own competitive events like the Calling Chicago. And the best part is, even though it's a more powerful format, it's not completely broken because LSS has been managing it as well. When 8 Star Starvos topped the first ever event, they hit a whole bunch of cards, restricting them to one copy. And when Zen took over LL, like he did every format, they restricted Bonds of Ancestry to just a single copy as well. And so not only are LSS willing to make major hits to CC and Blitz to maintain those formats, they're also willing to make the necessary changes to LL, and this gives me a lot of hope for the future of all the formats in the game. However, the ban list was just one half of this article, with the other half being the change in design philosophy. Of course, this has major implications for literally everything that's going to be released in the future, so let's be done with the banless portion and move on over to that. While I'm not going to read over the whole article, I do want to quickly go over the original design principles versus the new ones. Originally, the four principles were start full, reduce variance, every card counts, and reward good decisions, not good luck. These have been updated to class, talent, and hero identity, empower agency, every card counts, and paths to victory. Essentially, the class, talent, and hero principle is about each hero and talent feeling flavorful and unique, both in theme and mechanics. Every card counts is the same as before, with cards having multiple uses, and it's how you use them that matters the most. But the other two principles, Empower Agency and Paths to Victory, are the two that I really want to look at, because these are the two that have the biggest implications for the future of the game. Empower Agency is what replaced the old principle, Reduce Variance, and I think the new one is much better. See, card games are all about variance. You build your deck out of a huge pool of cards, randomize it, and clash it against an opponent who also has a randomized deck. This is inherently high variance compared to something like chess, but with cards having multiple uses, Flesh and Blood mitigates potential issues with variants far better than most other TCGs. However, there is a problem with variants when it comes in the form of what James calls extreme offensive overlaps. What this means, at least by my understanding, is when your hand can go above and beyond the normal damage output to get past your opponent's defenses. You can do this by setting up an arsenal or by drawing more cards and letting you punch through to actually bring your opponent's life total towards zero. Now, of course you want players to be able to kill one another, but the issue is that when offense goes to an extreme. Think about what Zen could do with Art of War. Once he drew it, all he had to do was arsenal it, block with his equipment, and then have his big 30 plus damage turn. And as the opponent, you just kind of had to sit there and take it, often losing the game right then and there. And it's this specifically that LSS want to reduce, the lack of agency. Two other heroes that were like this pre-ban were Prism and Kano. When Prism played two Toma Divinities and a Soraya, then dropped an Arclight Sentinel, I mean, what the hell were you gonna do? You just had to sit there and pray to Soul that they didn't draw the cards they need. As for Kano, I mean, I'm pretty sure all of us have had a game 
game where they're at like two and you're presenting lethal and they just go, mm, okay, I'll crack stormies and see if I can kill you. And if you don't have an oasis or spite, then you just, you just wait to see if you die or not. By banning all the cards that freely draw more cards, which is what James points out as the greatest offense in the game, it reduces the ceilings of these types of decks. If Prism wants to ALS lock you, well, now she has to set it up over multiple turns instead of just waiting for the double tome. Kano now has to set up more as well because he can't draw off Tome of Aetherwind or Tome of Fiendal. And Zen, I mean, well, they hit Ardivore and Bonds of Ancestry, which brings his ceiling way down. So can we really hate him anymore? Of course we can. Fuck Zen. All my homies hate Zen. Enigma gang, rise up. In all seriousness though, I have felt that the game was losing agency at an alarming pace, and Zen really was one of the worst. I mean, most of this game's interactive cards are two for sixes with on hits, and Zen was able to just block with armor, and that armor would give him the cards he needed. So like, even if you did everything right, he had just a get out of jail free and an instant kill button, all rolled up into the same package. All he had to do was see the Art of War and you just, you had no agency against him. He just killed you. And if this is the kind of gameplay LSS wants to move away from, oh, count me in. See, the problem with these kind of strategies is that they are beatable, yeah. Like you can play new against Zen and destroy him or play brutes with scab skins into Prism. But if you're not playing one of the decks that counters these over the top strategies, yeah, good fucking luck. Over the years, the game has slowly started to feel more and more extreme with too many heroes that had these 90-10 or 80-20 matchups. Or the matchups were 50-50, but that 50-50 came down to whoever drew the right cards first, not player skill. And I think this is a good thing to change. LSS focusing on spreading out this damage over many turns in order to make good decisions, not pure variance, be the deciding factor of a game, is a huge positive direction for flesh and blood. As I said earlier, this game used to be way more interesting with its tight interactive games. Now, maybe it's just because myself and my friends were bad at the game, but I remember having way more matches that would end with both players at one life back in those early days. Unfortunately, I don't remember the last time that this has happened in current flesh and blood. And I mean, it's not like we have to have all games always go to both players at one life, but having wildly swingy games where someone wins at 20 plus life because they just drew the nuts, maybe that's best relegated to the living legend format. Cause like, don't get me wrong, doing the broken thing is super fun to do, but when it comes to, you know, actual game balance and the player experience from both sides, well, maybe it's not so good to have these hugely swingy turns, especially for competitive play. However, just because LSS wants to bring this ceiling down does not mean they want to power everything down so much that games end in fatigue. In fact, James highlights this in the other design principle, Path to Victory. It makes it very clear that he wants players to be able to output enough damage so that most games end with the player hitting zero life total rather than decking out. And if anyone remembers old him fatigue, this is a goddamn blessing. While I don't think fatigue should be removed from the game entirely as you know it is a viable way to win, I do very much agree with games actually ending sometime this century. I am very glad that LSS wants to make sure every deck has the capacity to output enough offense to actually kill their opponent. Whether players actually use the offense rather than just playing those pure fatigue strategies, well that's it's another story altogether. Either way, with wanting to reduce the ceilings of decks while also maintaining the ability for heroes to actually kill one another, I think we're gonna see Flesh and Blood return to its roots in both Classic Constructed and Blitz. This doesn't mean that there aren't going to be very one-sided matchups though, as I think it's just by its very nature that some strategies are going to counter others. For example, Enigma's Ward strategy is basically directly countered by Riptide's Trap strategy. But by bringing down the ceiling, this allows LSS to print cards into classes that specifically help with these bad matchups, and I do have a lot of hope that we can start seeing less of these 90-10 splits and maybe more 70-30, where with a lot of skill and a little luck, bad matchups can be overcome. In fact, that's another thing this article addresses. In the wrapping up portion at the end of the article, James talks about polarizing matchups and specifically Warrior and Guardian who are getting support to even these out. I imagine this will be in the form of mastery packs since the first one is Guardian. But even in Rosetta, we're seeing LSS address problems that some classes have into others in the shape of generics. We've gotten a lot of generic hate in pretty much every set for a long time now, except Bright Lights, of course, and this is no exception. On top of the three CNC light cards, we've also got Cut Through the Facade, which is a three for seven that can't be defended defended by auras, and if it hits, you get to pop one. I could be wrong on this card and it could just be useless, but my gut's telling me this is something Guardians have needed since like Everfest to deal with Illusionists. I mean, as much as I hated old him, he had literally no hope into Aura Prism, and a card like this could have been a great way to give Guardians at least something to try and deal with their near unwinnable matchups. Even though I'm an Illusionist player myself, I am glad this card finally exists. If there are powerful strategies like Spectra Auras, I think there should also be 
ways to deal with them. Again, I feel like the biggest downside of this card is that we're getting it now instead of way back when they printed a bunch of zero cost spectre auras that also have block value and a weapon that could make them all attack for one over and over and over again. Between the changes in design principles, lowering the ceiling of decks, and giving heroes access to more answers for problematic matchups, I am very, very excited for Flesh and Blood's future. Obviously, LSS haven't had a perfect track record with balancing the game at all times, but articles like this, coming from James White himself, really go a long way to show just how much they are learning and growing as a development team. As someone who's done a long-term project, that being this YouTube channel, I am well aware of how easy it is to miss things and make mistakes. So personally, what matters to me most is that LSS as a company continues to be self-reflective and continues to improve. And hey, at least they didn't blame their multiplayer format yet again for their fuck-ups. The day that happens is the day you know this game is going to shit. There is a lot to be excited about in Flesh and Blood right now. The Living Legend format, new sets to support weaker heroes, the Living Legend format, a more balanced classic constructed, the Living Legend format, more answers to polarizing matchups, and did I mention the Living Legend format? God, I am, dude, I am just so happy to be playing OG Prism again. Like Luminaris, the OG Luminaris is so fair and so balanced. It just all is right in the world again. I get, I get to play such a good deck. But anyways, those are my somewhat organized thoughts on the banned and restricted article and what it might show for the future of Flesh and Blood. I made a video around the start of the year about how we were entering the golden age of the game, and aside from the hiccup that was Zen, I still think we're there. There's just so much to look forward to in this game, and a bunch of stuff I didn't even get the chance to talk about. One thing I would really like to know though is what you all think about this. I mean, I know it's the norm for YouTubers to ask for comments for, you know, the algorithm, but I actually want you guys to comment because I deleted my Twitter, so I just need to get an idea of how everyone is feeling. So. Go on and share your thoughts down below and hit subscribe if you haven't yet. And thanks to all of my patrons. You guys are absolutely beautiful and I, I truly appreciate the support. Thanks to all of the Giga Chads like Saint, Geeks First, Elixir, Vinny, Smokopotamus, John, Ty, James, Chemical, Bryant, Transient Fire, Dark Memoria, Big Hungry, and Wolf Shadow Mancer. Then we've got the Alpha Chads Thomas, Zajima, and Pavel. And finally, there's the Super Chads Bruno, Thal, Eric, CC, Ben, and Yagwa Doodles 21. Thanks again as always, and stay Chadley, my friends.